Good morning to each one. So good to be with you on this first Sunday of the new year. I invite you to take your Bibles out and be open to the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, please. Lamentations, chapter 3. Of course, as everyone knows, many of our own are out due to various illnesses, many who have contracted the coronavirus. And our thoughts and prayers are with each, each one that will be back with us soon. We are blessed with visitors. Some of my family are still in town. My youngest sister, Rachel, and her husband, Clint, the Dean family. Um, well, think there are any relation to our beings, but uh, we'll have to check the ancestry on that. But uh, we're so happy to have them and their children with us. As we'll be leaving out this afternoon, so remember them as they travel back to North Carolina, where they live. I know many have been anxious to turn the calendar to get to a new year to 2021 and leave 2020 in the past from many statements that I've heard or things I've seen on social media and we can't be blamed and others can't be blamed either to be eager to, in many respects, I suppose, to leave a very difficult, unusual and challenging year behind us. It was a year ago in Baytown, Texas, that I was preaching a sermon, I think probably many were preaching, of having 2020 vision. And you think about it, the only one that had perfect vision for what was to come this year was our Heavenly Father. None of us could perceive that there was going to be a worldwide pandemic that would affect one and all of God's creation. And so we're eager for a new year, a, a fresh start. And yet, I'm glad that Gil led the song, and I requested some, but I didn't request this one, but I'm glad that he led Count Your Many Blessings. Because one thing I was concerned about, particularly among the people of God, is that maybe in the midst of the adversity and difficulties and hardships and for some heartache, no doubt, that we might lose sight of God's blessings. Because one of the themes of that song in those verses is even in the difficult times, God's blessings are still there and present. And so before we leave 2020, and even as we've entered 2021, and yet many of our own are having difficulties and trials, and here's a new year. And I think it's a reminder that though we might not face, hopefully, in our lifetime, another worldwide pandemic, there's always going to be trials, there's always going to be troubles. So sufficient for the days, it's on trouble, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34. Man who's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, Job would say. And so there's always going to be trials. There's already going to, always going to be hardships. There's going to be illnesses and sicknesses and diseases. There's going to be death because we all have our point. And just as 2020 experienced birth, life, and death, so will 2021. But I'm reminded of that righteous servant, Jeremiah. As smoke still ascended from his beloved city that had been destroyed by the Babylonians, the city of Jerusalem, and the house of the Lord had been destroyed. Many of his people have been killed and others, many others carried away captive. He says, this I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. And so I, th I think it's important, as many 
I was hurried to leave maybe 2020 in the past that we remember this every single day. Regardless of the peaks and the valleys of life, the joys and the sorrows, here's the constant. Here's what never changes. The Lord's loving kindness, it never ceases. His compassions, they never fail. In fact, they're new every morning, including today. Great is his faithfulness. And so let us with Jeremiah always be mindful to recall this to mind. Therefore, we have, we have hope. A well-known lady that was blind throughout her life said the struggle of life is one of our greatest blessings. Take that in. The struggle of life is one of our greatest blessings. It makes us patient, sensitive, and godlike. It teaches us that although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. Helen Keller also said this, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet, only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. All right, let's turn the page a bit and focus a little bit on 2021 that the Lord has brought us into. When the new year comes, we think about goals, goal setting. Some don't do it, many do. And I think it's a good thing to do, to challenge us to set goals before us. The Bible sets goals before us. The most important goal of all is set before us continually, the goal of heaven. Paul says, I press toward the goal. It's not wrong to have goals. We better have goals. It's not wrong for a local church to have goals, to have plans, uh, not just to go by the, uh, the whim and uh, not have thought and planning and forethought to it. And we have that here with our classes and the focus of what we're trying to accomplish in our Bible classes. And we, we have that uh, and hopefully resuming soon of ladies' classes and men's leadership class and children's class and evangelism. It's important that we have goals. It's important that we have individual goals as well as congregational goals. And certainly I would encourage you to do that. Maybe you've already done that, written some down, but I want to suggest three to you this morning for your consideration. First of all, resolve to live by faith not by fear. Make that a goal. And I think that ought, ought to be a goal of every child of God in particular, every Christian. That I am going to make up my mind, I'm going to purpose in my heart that the way I live my life is going to be lived by faith, not by fear. Unless we're talking about fear of God, reverence of God, we need to live by godly fear, but I'm not talking about that kind of fear in this point. Now, first of all, what is faith? What do I mean when I say to live by faith? Well, go with me in your Bibles. You might already be in Isaiah, but I want to go to some other places first. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Because here's a great place to go if you want to know what faith is all about, right? Because the whole chapter thing is faith. In fact, it begins in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 11. Tell us what faith is. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. The New American Standard Bible says the assurance. It's the evidence of things not seen. Again, the New American Standard Bible says the conviction of things not seen. For by the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And then we have all these great men and women from the Old Testament scriptures of faith. You want to know what faith is and what it's about? Then read about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and so on. Verse 6, so verse 6, but without faith, 
it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to have faith then, right? Can't please God. It's impossible to please our creator, Heavenly Father, if we do not believe in him. And furthermore, he doesn't just stop there in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Not just that we believe he exists, but because we believe in him and who he is. And then he reveals himself to us on the pages of scripture. We then have obtained knowledge of him and of his divine will. And then we believe we obey his will because he is a rewarder of those who what? Those who diligently seek him. That's living by faith. That I believe in God. That I believe this is his inspired word. That I come to know God through reading these words, his revelation to mankind, that then I believe what I read, I obey his will, and I diligently seek him in my life each and every day is living by faith and not by fear. So then faith comes by hearing, as Jason quoted earlier this morning in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Every time we read God's word, if we're paying attention, if we're allowing it to enter into our hearts and minds, believing it, accepting it, what should happen? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, if as Peter says in verse Peter 2 and verse 2, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That every time we read and feed and meditate Psalm 1 2 upon God's word. Our faith should be growing, which helps us to live by faith and not by fear. Faith, we trust in God. We trust in God. We trust in his promises. We believe in his promises, as we talked about this morning with our Old Testament study, that God is promised and he cannot lie to us. We have faith in God and his will and the future hope. The future hope of heaven. It dictates how we think and how we act, how we behave, how we live our lives. Not the fear of man, not the fear of carnal things, fleshly things. The fear of God. Isaiah chapter 41 And in verse 10, <clears throat> Isaiah 41, verse 10, fear not, God says to his people, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Think about that. How many times in Scripture, and it's over and over, Old Testament, New Testament, God tells his children, do not be afraid. Do not fear. And here, fear not. Why? Why should we not fear? For I'm with you. Isn't that what the New Testament says? That God is with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. It does. There's a promise. There's an assurance. Do I have faith in that? Do I believe that? Do I have more fear of God and reverence for him, godly fear, or fear of physical things, of fleshly things, of carnal things? We read in Proverbs chapter 29 and in verse 25, But the fear of man brings a snare or a trap. But whoever trusts the Lord shall be saved. Proverbs 29, verse 25. Fear. Fear does that. Fear of man, fear of physical things. It, it does. It entraps us. It does, it does bring a, a snare. Fear can be 
can be and is so often so debilitating if we allow it to be. But again, whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. Think about the time that Jesus, the gospel accounts with the Sea of Galilee. One of the occasions he is in the boat with them, right? Sleeping. And there's a great storm and waves are coming in. Boats filling. Master, we're perishing. Save us, play up. Save us. Four of those men, at least, were fishermen. They knew those waters well. But they were fearful. They were scared for their lives. Who was there right there with them? Literally, with them. The creator of the heavens and the earth, the Son of God. What does Jesus do in that text? He rebukes them and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and there's a great calm, but he rebukes them for their lack of faith and their fear. Why are you afraid? Oh, ye of little faith. You see, fear and faith cannot coexist together unless we're talking about fear of God, but fear of man and fear of things in this world. How can they coexist together? That, is, that kind of fear chips away and weakens our faith. Same, same thing when Jesus one night was walking on the water, but thought there was a ghost inside. Do not be afraid. Peter comes out, he begins to walk on the water, but then he begins to sink. Jesus rebukes him. Why did you doubt? Oh, you little thing. Doubt and fear is the enemy. And there's been much of that in this past year. And there's things that make us afraid. And it's not that I've never been afraid of different things, but we need to be like David who said, whenever I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, speaking to God. We have to refocus ourselves and bring us back to God and his will and his promises and who, will, who is there with us, who will never leave us, who says to us, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand and so we can say with David that yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil David you what I will fear no evil you think this virus is evil yeah it's not good and many of us here have had it it's rough for some not bad at all for others. Led to their death. Others still battling it. But even when it's not life threatening, it's pretty miserable to go through. But whatever it is, whatever disease or illness or health problem, because we have health problems besides COVID 19. But yea, though I walk through the valley, valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why, David? For he says, You are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. And so I would challenge each of us, those listening, those here present in the audience this morning, resolve to live your life by faith in God and his word. Trust and obey as we began our worship service this morning. And don't allow fear to overcome you and overwhelm you, but cast it out. Perfect love, what? Cast out fear. Perfect love, cast out fear. That's what the scripture says. Let's do that. Another goal in 2021. I put before us. Resolve to grow in your faith. You know, the thing about this point, of course, also it's very personal. I can't do that for you. We can assist, right? We can assist in, in the teaching and instruction and encouragement and spending time together in prayer and Bible study. But if, if I don't myself want to grow, it's not just going to happen, right? 
And so, again, there has to be that purpose of heart that we are determined that I'm going to grow. And here's the thing about being a follower of Christ. We ought to always be growing. We ought to always be advancing. We ought to always be progressing and going forward and not backwards. But we know the backwards can happen and will happen if we're not going forward, right? Because we read of uh, the church in Laodicea, and they were what? They're neither cold nor hot. They were they were lukewarm. And what did Christ think about that in Revelation 3? It, 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 talk about disdain. He disdained it. It was disgusting. He says, I'm going to skew you or vomit you out of my mouth. And so he says, repent and be zealous. Be zealous. They were just the opposite. Think about what Jesus said in John 15. When he said, I am the true vine, ye are the branches, speaking of the disciples. And he talked about bearing fruit, and then I'm going to prune you. Cut you back so you can bear what? More fruit. But those who don't bear fruit, those who are not producing, those who are not growing, I'm going to cut off. Throw in a pile, and they're going to be burned. But over and over in Scripture, it emphasizes the importance of growth. In Hebrews chapter 5, remember in verse 11 beginning, the writer there speaks of those who had become dull of hearing. And he says, by this time, you ought to be what? You ought to be teachers. But you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Why? Because solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised from good and evil. But by this time, the expectation, the understanding is that you were here and you shouldn't be here now. But you've gone, you've gone backwards. And so that's what I was saying earlier. If we're not going forwards, if we're not progressing spiritually in our growth, we're going the opposite direction. And so as you think back over 2020, I think in many ways it, it has and continues to have an adverse spiritual effect on God's people and the Lord's church. But we have to overcome that individually and congregationally. We have to press through that with God's help, overcome that, and still grow in our own faith and still grow numerically as we do the Lord's work. And not allow ourselves to become stagnant or lukewarm and even go backwards where we have to be taught again. Instead of being the teachers, we have to be the student and learn the basics again that we have forgotten. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5, beginning, but also for this very reason. Notice how he speaks of getting to the point of being able to grow. He says, getting all diligence. I love that word in Scripture, both Old and New Testament, of diligence. One of my favorite words in the Bible, diligence. Opposite of, of uh, laziness, right, is to be diligent. And if you give all diligence, you know what's going to happen? You're going to grow, and I'm going to grow. If we'll do that, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self control, to self control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound. You'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. There's our word again. Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an interest will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of the undeniable messages that Peter is conveying to the Christians then and to Christians now is that our spiritual growth is directly connected to going to heaven and not falling away and being lost. You see that? That if these things are yours and abound, you'll neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to... if, if if you do these things, you'll never stumble, and interest will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom, heaven, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We better be growing. 
We better resolve to grow. And so as you look over these seven Christian graces that are identified by Peter here in verses five through seven, of adding to your faith, do you see one that stands out to you? What would you identify perhaps as a, a weakness, a shortcoming in your spiritual walk that you need to add to? I mean, we can all grow in knowledge, right? And whether you're following the Bible reading chart that we sent out by email, and don't forget if you haven't picked one up, the bookmarks are there at the front of the building. Or you have your own plan that you're following, and you don't have to follow the one that we have. But just that you're, we're spending more time in God's Word. If you're just reading a few verses, and that's more than you had been doing daily, then that's that's better. That's that's gonna, that's growth. The Bible reading charts three at the most four chapters for each day. That's not that much to read through the course of our day. But doing that and paying attention to what we're reading and as Jason even worked in the application to our giving from the text of Genesis 4 and the offering, you're going to grow. I mean, there's things you're going to see that even though you've read that text before, the connections and thoughts that you maybe didn't make before. But that's an area that we all need to add in always is, is knowledge of God's will and gain that wisdom, not just having the head knowledge, but applying it, living it. Self-control, what about that one? You want me to work on that more? Armin up. I need to identify myself. So right now, uh, yeah. Whether it's the tongue that James describes as a fire that we must bridle, or religion is vain. That's pretty powerful, right? Maybe that's an area. Self-control. Uh, how I speak to others, family. Uh, Brother, non Christian, um, the tone of voice, euphemisms, perhaps. Well, that's not the really bad word. Well, should be speaking those words either. Should I let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth? Maybe it's thoughts I have that are ungodly and in the context of love. Self control. Self control in, in, self, in all aspects of our life is, is needed, isn't it? Maybe that's something you too need to. Add to, adding to your faith, adding more strength there. That's a weakness there. I need to grow in that area. Well, make up your mind you're going to do that and how you're going to do that. Not just, yeah, I need to do that. Yeah, I need to do that is not resolving to do that. Making up my mind, this is, this is a weakness. I need to grow, and this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Or these are the things I'm going to remove from my life that are a stumbling block to me that are causing me to remain weak in sin in this area. 2 Peter 3, 18, but growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like what Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 15. When he said, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Sometimes growth is not always visible, but sometimes it is. And in this case, he says, if you give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to everybody. They'll see it. They'll see it in you, Timothy. Your maturity, your, your growth spiritually. And yes, it, it, it needs to be seen as well, not to receive recognition, pat ourselves on the back to God's glory, but when you grow, isn't it a wonderful thing to see Christians grow young and old and see them become more involved, more active, more knowledgeable, participating more in the Lord's work? It certainly is. So resolve to grow in your faith in this year. And thirdly, resolve to help the Lord's work advance. I need to work on me, but also I want to contribute to the whole, to the collective body, and specifically for the saints here to the Jerry Whitson Road Church of Christ. And so how can I do that? How can you do that? 
How can you personally help the Lord's work advance and progress and increase numerically? And just the whole church here be benefited. Well, one thing is to resolve that I'm going to use my God-given talents and abilities to his glory and the furtherance of his work in this locality. We need to resolve that. That I will be a participant and a contributor to the Lord's work. Not just sit in a seat in a queue. Be present is important to be here, but also to be active in contributing. In Ephesians chapter 4, I love how the section concludes in verse 16, where it says, from whom the whole body, speaking of the previous verse, that uh, grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body. For the edifying of itself in love. You have a part. You have a role. You are one of the parts of this local church. And so the effect of working by which every part does its share. Am I doing my share? If I haven't been doing my share, then I'm going to resolve to do my share. To help cause growth of the body. And here, this is the local body of Christ. In this community. For the edifying of itself in love but this work can and it will explode with growth if we will resolve to unite together in doing the Lord's work here together I'm convinced of that we, we had these challenging times and yeah ideally this never happened this has been over months ago that no one was sick right now, that everything's back to normal, no mask, we can go back to hugging and shaking hands and showing the affection that is within us of brotherly love. Ideally, I, we can arrive here, the Flowers family from Texas hit the ground running and jump in and doing the Lord's work. Well, we're going to do the Lord's work. I still plan on doing some running and hopefully we're doing it, and it will intensify. But God's word says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6 that if we will plant and we will water, that he will what? He will give the increase. Now, here, here goes back to our first point, the walking and living our lives by faith, not fear. Do you believe that? Do you believe that statement? That if we will do the Lord's work, that if we will be preaching and teaching his word, planting that seed, watering that seed, causing it to grow. God's going to give the increase. You believe that, don't you? I do. And that's why I believe that this work here is going to expand and it's going to grow when we have that united mindset and we rise up and build. God's going to give the increase. And we're going to give him Boring. And we're going to refuse to hide or bury our talents. As a lazy man, the wicked man did in Matthew 25, but we're going to participate, and we're going to encourage, and we're going to invite others to come, and we're going to be an active member of the body of Christ. Can we resolve to do those three things in 2021? To live by faith and not by fear. To grow in our own faith and walk with God. And to resolve to help the Lord's work advance, increase, progress in this place. Or wherever you are a member. And again, it's not just going to happen. you got a goal. got these goals, but you got to have a plan. And then you got to take action. Because that's why so many New Year's resolutions fall to the wayside after the first week or so. We had some good intentions. We did it for a while, whether it was eating better, exercising more, uh, or spiritual things, following a Bible reading plan or schedule. It's great to have goals. You better have a plan to implement than to take action. 
And so each of us are going to need to do that if we're going to have success in these areas. If you will, I invite you to take your hymn book out, open to the song of invitation to me. You'll notice our invitation song is I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are noble, these have alerted my sight. If you're not a child of God, no better way to start off a new year with a new beginning, become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Again, just like personal growth, you can't do that for one another. It's an individual's decision. And then even after that, we have to work out our own salvation with fear and truth. But we hope that you will resolve within yourself to be obedient to the gospel of Christ. You will not, won't, no longer be lost, but be saved. No longer a sinner, but a saint. To have the blood of Christ wash away your sins. By believing in him, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, John 3.16, to repent of your sins, Acts 2.38. To confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God, raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9, 10, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. You'll be raised to walk in newness of life. And there's no newness like it. You have all your sins taken away. To be a Christian, to be saved, to have the hope of heaven, to be a child of God, and all the spiritual blessings that you'll now have because all spiritual blessings are in Christ, Ephesians 1 3. Perhaps you are a child of God with a sin in your life. No better way to start off the new year than for you to resolve to get your life right with God, to repent, be zealous again for Him. Your subject, Lord's invitation, let us know as we stand here and be saved.